And I just want to make a note before we start today in, uh, in recognition and celebration of, of Mother's Day. Um, Mother's Day is equally a day of remembering and celebrating mothers in our lives, but I think for many of us it's, it's equally a day of, uh, of mourning, maybe, of remembering um, maybe relationships that we did not have with our mothers that we wish that we did. Many of us are thinking about our mothers that we have lost that are no longer with us here today. And, um, and, we're, and as Jeff prayed, we're thinking about you as well. I want to, to say something that, that you don't often hear in, in church, um, at least not in this church, which is that if, if God is, and God is, to be everything to us spiritually, that God is our, is our everything, that God meets all of our needs, that many times when we pray, we pray to God because this is the way that Jesus taught us to pray to God as Father. But I want you to know that everything that you, that you want, that you need from a mother, God is that too. And that we see in the scripture that God is referred to as like a, a mother hen who gathers the chicks to herself, even when the chicks refuse to get under there, they don't want to stay there, but gathering her babies together, that God is a El Shaddai, the all-nourishing one, that, that God is anything that you would think, even for those of you who didn't have what you would have wanted from your mother, God is that to you. And so my prayer is that today, as you, some of you are thinking of your mothers in, in various ways, that you allow God, that you receive from the Lord that nourishment, that tenderness, that care, the love, the warmth, the support, the guidance that you need today. I pray that for you today. So as is the case with, with many of you here today, you have countless stories of your own mother. Some of them are good memories. Some of them may not be good memories. Some of you may have uh, stories of, of sacrifice and selfless giving of things that you didn't deserve or couldn't have done for yourself. I think all of us, at some point, we have that experience, even if we don't remember it, the experience of exp having life that we didn't do anything to deserve because somebody had to have us, right? I wasn't born in a, like a laboratory or something. Um, and probably none of us were either. Like somebody had to go through labor to have you. And so even just in that act, even if... After that point, mom wasn't there for you, or at some point in your life, mom wasn't there for you the way that you would have wanted. At some point, mom went through labor to have you, and even in that, and that in itself was an act of sacrifice and giving and laying down her life. Now, I have a lot of stories I could share about my mom. If you don't know, my mom is actually sitting right here, so I'm not going to say anything too embarrassing about my mom. Um, I can tell you about the food that she used to make that I loved the way that she used to sing and pray with me before I would go to sleep, the special things that she would do to let me know that she loved me. My favorite time of year was about the end of the school year, around May or, uh, or early June. She would do this thing called dream lunches, where she would say, like, for one day, you can ask for anything you want for your lunch. It could be like a, you know, you know, you know ice cream sundae, whatever. You can have whatever sandwich, hamburger you want, whatever. The only thing is, you got to earn it. You got to do something, you have to do something creative to let me know what you want for your, for your special dream lunch. So you got to write a song, a poem, a story. You got to do a, put together like some lame rap, whatever. Like just, <laughs> just do something to let me know what you want for your lunch and, and you can have it. So um, I'm trying to continue that, that tradition with my kids. But I could tell you about the late night. She would stay up helping me with my homework, washing my team's basketball, my basketball team's sweaty uniforms. Uh, when I got older, I could tell you about the nights that she would wait up for me to get home. Um, but there's one story, one, one, of the, one of the stories that stands out. When I was a kid, I befriended this other kid who was, he was kind of a bad influence on me. And, um, and so one day, because I, I, really, I really just wanted this guy to be my friend. And so this guy said, okay, if you want to be my friend, I'm going to tell you some bad words and I want you to say them. Okay? <laughs> if you want to be my friend. Now, these were not just, it wasn't just like heck muffins or something like that. Like, this is like... Or, you know, like, oh, tootie for tootie or something like that. Like, this is like the, like the hardcore, you know, like the, like the big ones. You know, like the big ones. Like, he was getting me to say, like, the real, the real stuff. But he, but he said, if you want to be my friend, you got to say him. All right, here you go. 
you should just say this. I'm, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> but you, you know, you, you, you just, just imagine, I can't want you to say like, blah, blah, blah. okay, I can do this. And I said it. And he rattled off like, you know, three or four. They were like, they were like combo words. It wasn't just like one at a time, but it was like, mm-hmm, <laughs> you know? You say it like that with, with like, like, like with ganas, right? Like you really want to say it, okay? So, so I said it. And this guy, man, he played me the whole time. He was like, all right, good. Teacher! <laughs> now, he didn't care that he was going to get in trouble. But he just wanted to see me get in trouble. So, so there I was sitting in the, you know, in the, in the principal's office or whatever. And I, you know, my, my ears were like burning hot red because I knew my mom was going to walk in and she was going to see me sitting there. Like, hey. So my mom gets there and then, and, you know, the principal or whatever is like, well, Johnny, da, 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 you know, I did this. And so she takes me to the room and she's like, I'll talk to him. All right, Johnny. And I'm all, at this point, I'm already like, oh, mommy, don't kill me. <laughs> mommy, please don't kill me. She's Johnny. Just very calmly, just tell me what you said, okay? I just, I just tell me what you said. Okay, okay, I'll tell you what I said. <laughs> I can't say it again. I don't know, there's just something different about like when you're with your friends and you're like, yeah, just rattling off whatever, but like when you're with your mom, I can't say those words to my mom. I can't say those words in front of my mom. You know, they have that saying, right? You kiss your mother with that mouth. It's like, I, I, can't, I can't say that to my mom. So I couldn't say it to my mom. I just couldn't bring myself to say it. I just felt so like, I just felt so ugly inside because I just let these words come out of my mouth in front of my mom, no less. So I'm all walking around feeling like, ah, oh, I messed up, whatever, and I shouldn't have said those things. And I know some of you are like, I did worse than that when I was a kid, whatever, and I probably did do worse than that when I was a kid, but there's one example that I'm willing to share with you. So, <clears throat> so we were there. For some reason, we were at Toys R Us. We were buying a present for somebody else. It's a kids, kids love to go to, well, when Toys R Us was open, used to love to go to Toys R Us. But I hated to go to Toys R Us when we were buying stuff for other kids. <laughs> so I'm standing in line at Toys R Us, going through, and I'm thinking, like, man, I'm, I'm scum or whatever. And I saw these, these, these uh, basketball cards, I think they were, or baseball cards or something sitting there. And they, they used to sell baseball cards with, like, little sticks of gum inside of them. And I saw, like, baseball cards sitting there. And I was, like, looking at them. And I don't know, Mom, mom somehow knows, like, when her kids like want something or they're thinking about something and moms just have this intuition about their kids. And so my mom just kind of slowly goes over there as we're standing in line, just picks up the baseball cards and just gives them to me like that. Simple, simple. I mean, how much do those baseball cards cost? Probably 75 cents or a dollar, I don't know. Now they're probably like 20. <laughs> but just in that simple act of giving me those baseball cards and saying, I'm going to get this for you, just in that simple act communicating to me, not only do I not hate you, not only do I not think that you're scum, but I still love you, I still like you, you're still my son. Simple act. So today we're, we're continuing with, with this series called uh, What God Has Done for Us what God has done and what it means for me. And we're continuing in this conversation. I hope that this sparks within your heart a desire to, to discuss more. What does this actually mean for me? What Can this actually be true for me? The things that God has done for us eternally. I was reminded again this past week that the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, is not just for the people who don't believe. Yes, there are people who don't know Jesus Christ, some of us who are here in this room right now, we're like, maybe we've got a kind of a distance relationship with God right now. Maybe we're not quite sure. Maybe we're still figuring things out. But the gospel is not just for people who are outside of the church, who are not Christians, who are not believers, who don't involve themselves with this institutionalized religion thing. The gospel is for believers too. And I was reminded about that again this week when I realized that some of us here, sitting here today, don't really know because it's not a part of our everyday lives. I mean, how many hard hearts do we have in this room? How many, how many hearts are there in this room who, when God speaks to you, maybe you're not ready to hear him or you don't want to hear what God has to say because it's not what you want to hear. Maybe it's not in the timing that you want or maybe it's not in the way that you want. Maybe you're wanting God to say something to you and God keeps saying something else to you, but you're like, I don't want to hear that, God. How many hearts do we have in this room that have been going to church or doing the Christian thing for a long time and so you've heard all the stories? 
You know all the stories of this person and that person. You know the story of Jesus dying on the cross. And so it just, it just, sounds, like a, it just sounds like a routine for you. It doesn't, there's no power in that truth anymore for you. And your heart has grown, grown cold. How many hard or cold hearts are there in this church? Maybe just within this room. Christian, church member, does your heart still marvel at the wonder of the good news of Jesus Christ or has your heart grown cold? Do you ever find yourself sitting in church thinking, I know this already? Now, I'm not just talking about having warm, happy feelings all the time, but it's really like a genuine joy, gratitude at what God has done for us. This is what I've been praying for the Holy Spirit to stir in me. I'm not just pointing fingers and saying, some of you are like this. This is me, more often than I care to admit. I know the stories. I've heard it all. I know scriptures. I can rattle off scriptures to you. But how often do I live with the reality of what God has done for me and what it means for me on a daily basis? So we're going through the book of Romans. We're, gonna, we're, we're continuing in chapter 5 today in this series. First, just a brief recap of what we've talked about so far. So the first week we talked about how without asking, without us asking anything, without us knowing that we needed him to, Jesus Christ died for us, right? That's called what we call, anybody remember, by the way, what's it called that Jesus Christ paid the price for our sin? We call that what? What do you remember? It's called atonement, okay? That's the, again, these are big words just used to kind of define what it is that we're talking about. And then requiring only that we truly believe what Jesus Christ has done for us, he redeems us, meaning that he gives value to our lives in the places, in all of the places where the lies, the torment of sin has ravaged our identities, he redeems us. That's called redemption, right? He redeems us. And then in this faith, God even goes a step further, as we talked about last week. He says, you know what? I'm not just giving you a new identity. I'm going to give you my identity. I'm sharing with you, allowing you to bear my righteousness, my holiness. He actually gives to us as if it were, uh, as, if, as if it really belonged to us, his holiness. Here, my righteousness is now yours. That's called justification. He justifies us. And because, of course, we need Jesus to do that. We need God to do that. Because when Jesus says, when God says, be holy as God is holy, you don't think he expects us to, to be holy on our own power, do you? How can God ever expect us to be holy as God is holy unless he is going to impugn, to share, to impart with us his holiness. God actually does that for you. You would do that for me, God? Yes, God says, I would do that for you. Now, what I want to share with you today as we continue through Paul's letter to the Romans, the Christians in Rome, is the natural or the supernatural result of those things that God has graciously done for us. If he has atoned for my sin, he has redeemed my life and given me value, and he has actually given me, shared with me his identity of righteousness and holiness, then what naturally would come out of that? So specifically today, we're going to focus on these two words called uh, regeneration and adoption. And we're going to start by reading in Romans 5. This is what it says. We're going to read 1 through 5, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we, we boast in the hope of the glory of God. But not only so, we also glory, we boast in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character. And character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Because God has been pour, God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. Now one of the, the things that stood out to me most when I read this passage over the last week was this, this last, uh, this, this, this verse that says that his love has been poured out into our hearts, right? I'm reminded that, that, that this is grace. This is God's gift that he's poured out into our hearts. What God's love does for us is that it makes us new. It regenerates us. It gives us something, it gives us a, a relationship, and as we're going to see, a reconciliation with God that we could never have on our own. 
And it says, we boast in God's glory, in the hope of the glory of God, and we boast in our sufferings. And what does that mean, to boast in God's glory? To boast in God's glory means that we say, what an awesome God, that God would do this for me. What an awesome God, that God would love me this way. And then he says, because of that, because we boast in this wonderful God, that we can boast in our sufferings, that we can actually, when we go through suffering, that we can actually boast about something, that we can actually have something to be thankful for. (laughs) God, it is so hard. It seems impossible to see past the troubles and the struggles of just today. I don't know about you, but I often can't hardly see past the struggles and the troubles of today. But Paul, in this book, is telling me that we have something to boast about, that we hope in the glory of God, and that God's glory, his majesty, his strength, his faithfulness, all he is, he shares that with us. That's why we can boast in God's glory. Because it's not just God's glory, but he shares that glory with us. Doesn't that sound infinitely better than just kind of muddling through life, right? How many of you ever said or felt, yeah, you know, can't wait till Friday, you know, another day, another dollar, just trying to get, just trying to make it through the week, just trying, right? I mean, how many times do we feel that? And I have to, I have to, I have to believe that God created us for more than that. Don't you ever, don't you ever feel like, God, this cannot be all there is. This cannot possibly be all there is, just to try to make it till Friday. For me, my Friday is Monday. So I just try to make it till Monday night. Is that all there is? And God is saying, no, actually, that's not all there is. To have a hope that God daily shares his glory with us and that one day we will see him face to face and be with him in glory forever. And there isn't going to be any more struggling and there isn't going to be any more suffering. But right now, the sufferings that we are going through is building into us the ability to share in that suffering and by doing that to share in the glory glory for eternity. I appreciate that Paul says, look, you can glory in God's riches and the beauty and everything God is, but Paul also understands reality because Paul's a human just like we are, right? So Paul says, yes, you glory in whatever, all the things that God has, but you also glory in your sufferings. Paul recognizes that life, more often than not, in some way or another, is full of suffering. We've all been through it at some point, on some level. Many of us are going through suffering right now, in this moment. And we have to believe that there's some kind of suffering for us in store in the future, because that's just kind of the way life goes. So Paul doesn't pretend those things aren't there, but instead he says that because of this new life that we have with God, and standing in this grace that we have, we can glory in our sufferings. That we don't just glory, we don't just praise and worship God for his glory. We can actually praise God within our sufferings and even because of our sufferings. Now, why would I ever want to praise God glory in my sufferings? What is there to glory about? And Paul says, well, I'm glad you asked because in suffering, it produces within us perseverance toughness, strength, the ability to carry on even when we don't want to carry on. And in perseverance, it builds within us character. We want to be a person of solid, strong character. And that character within us produces hope, the ability to see what could be and to keep hoping in that and trusting that there is going to be a day when that thing will happen. You know, it's strange when we go through suffering. I don't think anyone, I know I don't, never sit there thinking, you know, I'm really glad for this painful time because, man, by the end of this, I am going to be one persevering, you know, guy. Man, I am going to have such a solid character, so bring on the suffering. Come on. Is that all you got? Man, I am going to have a hope that is, you know, like, you can't, can't stop it. Nobody ever does that. When we are people who glory in God, we will be people who glory in our sufferings, not because we love suffering. It's because glorying in God and our sufferings allows us to see the bigger picture. It allows us to see that there's something beyond this suffering. 
See, when I get so caught up in my suffering, whatever the suffering might be, that I allow it to make me bitter toward life, that I allow it to make me raise my fist to the heavens and say, God, how dare you? Could you let this happen to me? When I, when I allow my suffering to, to cause me to, to speak harshly to my wife or my kids, to take my frustration out on the driver that cut me off on the freeway and try to pull up alongside of him so I can give him the dirty look. You know the dirty look that you do when, you, when somebody cuts you off and you want to pull up alongside of them so you can do this. <laughs> When I allow my suffering to cause me to go through my life and spend even one minute in rage or bitterness or resentment or unforgiveness or unchecked anger, that's not what God wants for us. That's not what God made us for. When I do that, I am failing to see the bigger picture. And yes, even when the people that God has blessed me with in my life, when I don't agree with my wife, when I don't like what my kids are doing, when I choose to unleash my wrath because I don't like what's happening, I'm failing to see the bigger picture. Those of you who are married, if you've ever been married, if you're thinking about being married, this is a hard part of what marriage is about. That marriage is not just for me to be happy and for me to try to make this person happy, that marriage is actually more, the, the bigger goal is that God is actually using this marriage to make me holy. That God is actually using this marriage and the things that drive me crazy about my lovely wife. God is actually using this marriage to make me more like Jesus Christ. To cause me to see this is the place. Johnny, hello, pa, 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 wake up. This is the place where you need to grow. That thing that drives you crazy, learn something from it. Persevere through it. You feel like you're suffering, oh, because Gloria doesn't understand me, oh, because Gloria thinks so differently than me, and oh, Gloria's driving me crazy, because Gloria's so strong. I love you. <laughs> oh, you're suffering so much, Johnny. Take that, learn perseverance. What did you think? Every day marriage is going to be like, hey, yeah, yeah, cakewalk, yeah, fine. No. Grow from it. Persevere with this woman that God has given you. Let God build your character through this. Let God produce hope that together you're going to grow doesn't always have to be like this. <clears throat> There's a level of maturity that you can reach where maybe the things that bother you now don't have to bother you forever. And I'm gonna get some water. <clears throat> so we grow in perseverance, we grow in strength of character, <clears throat> we grow in hope. <clears throat> and hope, Paul says, hope doesn't ever let us down. Not because everything that we ever hope for always comes true. Because we all know that every single thing that you hope for doesn't always come true. Does it? But hope doesn't put us to shame or let us down because, it, well, what does it say? Verse 5, hope does not put us to shame because God. Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. See, experiencing this new life, this regeneration that God makes you a new person is not just something that happens. It happens for some people and happens for others and who knows, you know. No, this regeneration, this new life was actually paid for with the blood of Jesus Christ. By trusting what Jesus Christ has done, we are made new. And just like we talked about with redemption and justification, it's not just that we have been regenerated, that we became a new person and now we never, ever, ever do anything. We are continuing to be regenerated. As Paul says in the second letter to the Corinthians, he says, though outwardly we are wasting away, outwardly we are wasting away. How many of you ever 
realize as your body grows older that you're wasting away. I realized that in the hard way this past week when I tried to play basketball for the first time in about a year. And, and not only did my knee start like flaring up, like what the heck, it's softball where my knee used to be, but, but also my shoe, just kind of like the back flap of my shoe just kind of <laughs> fell off. Like two minutes into the game that I started, the first game that I started playing, I was running around like, what, who's kicking the back of my foot? And I realized it was my own <laughs> flap of my shoe. I, I realize more and more that outwardly I'm wasting away. Now, there are things that I can do to keep my body healthy, like eat right and exercise, maybe not play basketball until I get new shoes, but, right? Outwardly, we are wasting away, Paul says, but inwardly, he says, we are being renewed day by day. Because, why? Our light and momentary struggles, troubles, afflictions, suffering, those things are achieving for us an eternal glory that outweighs all of the suffering that we go through. Same thing, right? Same writer, he's got similar themes, right? But he's saying that, yes, we go through these things, but what those sufferings are achieving in us is something that's eternal, and nobody can take it away from us. Everyone suffers, everyone struggles, goes through trials, pain, regeneration happens when we go through these things while holding on to our faith in Jesus Christ. When you hold on to your faith in Jesus Christ and you suffer, as everyone does, regardless of what you believe, you will be renewed. You will be regenerated. You'll be made new. Kind of like a snake shedding his skin, right? It's the, same, it's the snake. It's still the snake. But you kind of outgrew the skin. Now I don't need to get angry at the things that I used to get angry about anymore. Now I don't need to hold on to the resentment that I held on to because I held on to my faith through this thing and I learned. I learned perseverance and it built character within me. I hope I am changed because I clung to the Lord Jesus Christ and his love that he poured out on me. Church, I want this. I want this for myself. I want to see my life, my being be renewed and regenerated. Regeneration happens when we so worship God for his glory that we long to be with him, that we long to be like him. And so being like him, we learn to embrace our sufferings. And as contradictory as it sounds, it's by enduring our sufferings in faith that God actually regenerates us. The things that break us down, the things that make us feel like, God, I can't go on anymore, those are actually the things that God is using to build us up. Isn't that weird? How God works. So we're made new, regenerated, and so what does that do? Continuing in Romans. Verses 6 through 11. You see, Paul says, just at the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone ever die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we've now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, when he died for us and atoned for our sin, even when we didn't even know him when we were his enemies, how much more... We were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. I don't think anyone likes being called powerless. I don't think anyone likes feeling powerless. But when it comes to the battles that have been waged in eternity for our souls, for our, for our beings, that's ex exactly what we are. We are powerless. As we've already said many times, there is nothing that I could have ever done to save myself. I could die on a cross every single day of my life, and I would not be able to atone for my own sin. I would not be able to save myself, much less the entire world. So, and when we were powerless to do anything for ourselves, Romans says, and we were also powerless to even comprehend what's being done for us, that's when Jesus Christ died for the ungodly, meaning me. Again, I think, of, I think of motherhood. I think of that, that suffering that mothers go through before a baby is even conscious that they are, 
that they are. They're not even self-aware, right? What does a baby know? A baby just knows that it's in this warm, gooey place, and it kind of sounds like this. And then, and then one day, suddenly they are, they are brutally, you know, just awakened, this rude awakening into the world of bright lights and people slapping them on the butt to make them cry or, you know, cutting things off their body or covered in stuff and, you know, squirting things in their eyes and, you know, doing them, wrapping them in a blanket and now shoving them in the face of this person that, oh, hey, I think I know you. <laughs> Babies don't even know anything. And yet, mom has just been through hours of suffering. I think about that when I think of this scripture because that is a reflection. That, just think of all the ways that God has built into humanity like tangible pictures of what God's love for us looks like. That Jesus Christ went through all of this suffering before we even knew that we were supposed to ask for him to save us, before we even knew that we needed any, before we even realized our own, you know, like depravity or, or just like twistedness, when we, before we even realized, like, man, I'm, I'm messed up. Wow, I, 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 need some, I need some help. Before we even knew Jesus Christ did this for us, while we were still powerless, God's true love was demonstrated because he died for us while we were Sinners, and it actually says he died for us while we were still his enemies. <laughs> I think that's kind of funny, too, because as much as moms, you try not to think this way, sometimes the baby feels like your enemy, especially at, when, at a young age, and they're like, they won't stop crying. Right? When the baby won't stop, like, giving you a heart, like, sometimes the baby feels like, why are you doing this to me? Even though the baby has no idea what they're doing. Why won't you stop? Why won't you sleep? Why won't you stop pooping or whatever? You know, it's like, yeah, it can feel like that sometimes. And, right? Wait, where did that come from? That was really funny. It's perfect timing. Siri just said, yeah, that's what I figured. That was awesome. Thank you, Siri. You know, he goes on to say that if Jesus did this for us while we were his enemies, how much more will our lives be saved and transformed if we're reconciled to him? So if that's how much God showed his love for us when we were still separate and apart and enemies from him, imagine how much more we can experience his life and his love and this, this new life when we are reconciled to him. Imagine how much more we can experience. God has done this for every single one of us. God has, has, has given his life for us we didn't need to ask him for it, right? But, but we can actually experience that love for ourselves. We were once his enemies, now we're not. And who did that? Who made that possible? It's Jesus Christ, right? Now, here's, I want to be very clear on this because it's easy to get the wrong message with this. This is a wrong message that many Christians walk around with and this wrong message that may even contribute largely to many people staying away from Jesus Christ or what they perceive as Jesus Christ. See, God's goal in this, by telling us this through Paul, is not so that we can walk around for the rest of our lives with this cloud of shame over our heads, right? And God's goal through Paul is to tell us how bad you should feel about yourself. Because you did this to God. This is, why God. this is why Jesus had to die. Jesus did this, he said, while we were still powerless, right? What did Jesus say as he was being nailed to the cross? Father, forgive them, because what? They don't know what they're doing. He demonstrated his love for us by dying for us while we were even still his enemies. This is a reconciliation that is founded in love, which means it's true reconciliation. And what I want you to know, what I want to show you is that this reconciliation is not only one that says, okay, I'm, I'm not mad at you anymore. Because as I shared at the beginning, it's a very good feeling when somebody that you care about and somebody whose opinion of you you think very highly of shows you, okay, I'm not mad at you anymore. That is important. And it's not only one that says, okay, we don't have to be enemies anymore. It's important to know. Sometimes even the people that are in our lives, even, even those in our household, this woman that I love so much, it's amazing how sometimes we can feel like enemies. But I don't want to be her enemy, and I know she doesn't want to be my enemy. So it's a really good feeling when we can finally, we can finally just do this, and I, don't, and I don't feel like I'm forcing her to hug me. 
right? But she actually wants to hug me because I actually feel like this, okay, we're not enemies anymore. That's a good thing. But this is a reconciliation that actually goes a step further in saying, you were once a slave to sin, but now I am making you my child. Now you belong to me. Now there is nothing that you could do to separate yourself from me. Now I am yours and you are mine. Now I am yours and you are mine. And that's where we get to the next part of what I want to share with you today, which is adoption. That this is what God has done for us. I want to skip ahead a little bit to Romans, Romans 8. I actually have this one up on the screen for you. Because this is important. This is kind of the, this is kind of the, the, the key, to, this is the, where it all leads to, right? He, he atoned for our sin. He, 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 he redeemed our lives, gave value to us. He justified us in himself. He, regen, he gave us a new life, right? He, he, he gave, literally gave birth to us spiritually. We are reborn in him so that what? We can be part of his family. And this is what Romans 8 says, and starting with verse 14, as you see on the screen. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. One of the other things that I will always remember about my mom and my dad, too, is that, that they became kind of growing up, especially in high school, they became like second parents to a lot of my friends growing up. And my parents weren't just nice to my friends. They didn't just know their names and their stories. They didn't just give hugs when they saw them. My parents actually invited my friends, many of them from broken homes, many of them from abusive pasts. Many of them, they might have just been getting, trying to stay out of trouble. They brought these friends into our home. And they didn't just have them occupying space, like, yeah, you can sleep on a couch there, or, you know, just sit in the corner over there. They actually invited them to be in our home, like part of our family, and sometimes even to live in our home as a part of us. They slept on floors, couches, beds, they ate our food. And of course there were rules, and of course there had to be respect when they were in our home, but, but they were fully invited into our family and everything that our family had to offer. They were invited to be part of us, family, with all the rights, with all the privileges, with all the responsibilities. When I think back on the years of having people, kids my age, teenagers, in and out of our home, of my parents not just opening up the physical space, but my parents actually opening up their hearts to these youth, I can't help but see the heart of God reflected in that, how this is what God does for us, that God opens up his heart for us. And guess what? There's always room for more in God's heart. I remember having our first kid, and we just loved Elise so much. And and then when number two was coming along, I thought, how could I ever love another kid as much as I love this kid? And then this weird thing happens in your heart. It's not your physical heart, right? Because that would be a problem. But, but spiritually, in my heart, my heart opens up again for this second kid. How is it that I can love it? And then I was really scared, because then when we surprised, number three was coming along. I was like, oh, shoot, man, I already love two. <laughs> How am I possibly going to have the space in my heart to love another kid? Oh, oh no, what if, I, what if I can't love this kid? What if I can't, right, third child? You're right, but your mom loves you, right? What if I don't have space in my heart for this third kid? What if this third kid is just kind of like, what if I forget this kid at the store or something? Oh, man, it's going to happen. It's gonna, I'm going to forget this kid. I'm not going to have space. And then this kid comes along, and I'm like, I love this kid. And I don't love this kid any less than I did the first or the second. God's heart is reflected in that, that we have this ability as people. And it's not just with kids. Some of you may have never even had kids yet, but you have people in your lives that you're like, I love this person. How is it that I love this person? 
I thought I didn't have any room in my heart left to love this person, but I really love this person. I would, I would give my life for this person. Who is this person even? I, don't, I, don't, I didn't know on before I came to Trinity, but now I'm like, you know, I love on. I, I love this guy. I'm not, I'm not Vietnamese. I don't speak the language that he speaks in his home. I don't know. I, don't, I wasn't with him when he grew up. We didn't grow up together, but I love this guy. The church is to be a picture of this opening up that we do in our hearts for one another. Now we see that having the Holy Spirit, it says, makes us children of God, right? And it says it brings about our adoption to sonship. And just briefly, I've explained this in another sermon before, but I just want to say when it says sonship, that you, that you are made sons in God's family, he's not leaving out the daughters. It's not a sexist thing. When he says sonship, it's important to understand the cult cultural context, right? In those days, if you were a son in a family, they assumed the daughters were going to go off and get married, and they would belong to that family, and there are some cultures that still kind of operate like that now. But in this culture, it was the daughters would go off, they're going to belong to that family, but the sons, they were the ones who were going to stick around. They're going to get all the inheritance. They're going to get all the things that the parents have to offer them, that the parents have been holding on to for them. And sometimes if a, if a family didn't have a son to give their inheritance to, they would legally adopt the son so they could legally give all the inheritance to him. He would be adopted and he would have full status as a son. All of the rights, all of the privileges, everything that would, be, that would have been given to a biological son. So when it says that God's spirit brought about our adoption to sonship, it's not just speaking to the sons and the males. He's saying that in the same way that a person can be adopted into a family and still receive the full rights and inheritance, that's the way that God adopts us into his family and into his heart. He gives us, everyone who has the Holy Spirit, man, woman, no matter what, full status as a child of God. There are no second-class citizens in the family. There are no forgotten kids in the family of God. Do you know that? In God's eyes, in God's heart, there are no forgotten kids. There is no such thing as, oh, well, God says, I just didn't have time. Sorry, I had so many kids, and maybe I shouldn't have, but, you know, I just didn't have time for you. Oh, you know, I was just struggling to get by. You know, I'm a single dad and blah, blah, blah. There's no such thing as that. Everything, all of the heart of, the, of a mother and a father, everything is in God. And God has space for every single being, every single person. In other words, there's no member of this family that he's expecting to just marry off or get rid of someday. There's no member of this family who is unloved, forgotten. It doesn't matter how many children he has, he knows the names and the cares and the tears of each one. When I think of the families I know who have fostered and adopted children, I see the heart of God in that, the way they love their kids, the way that those kids have become a part of them. There's no doubt. They're family. And yes, as sons of daughters of God and co-heirs of Jesus, we do endure suffering, but we also share in the suffering so we can share in his glory. Church, this is what God has done for us. This is what we are to reflect as his church to each other to the world. This is what we should be reflecting. This is what we must be communicating. It's good news that you can be made new, that your past doesn't have to define you, that your inner being can be renewed every day, that you can experience a life that you never thought possible, a spiritual life, that your perspective on what is important, what matters can actually change, that even in your sufferings, you can grow in love and grace. It is good news, church, that you've been adopted into God's heart and family, that you're loved with a love that nothing could ever separate you from, that no rejection that you've ever experienced has to have any say in your life or your identity right now, that you are never without a family, that you're never without a place to call home in God's heart, that God shares his glory with you as his child. And you're not renewed so that you can be part of a religious system. You are not adopted into a religious system. You have been welcomed and enfolded in the everlasting arms of God, the God who created the universe in his power and wisdom, and the God who in Jesus Christ loved to the point of death, the God who through the Holy Spirit is closer to us than hands and feet. And you know what you have to do to experience this good news for yourself? I know what we tell each other, what we have to do to experience this is we got to try really hard. We have to be really good. We have to make ourselves worthy. We have to perform well so that God will 
give us what it is that he says he wants to give us. And this lie keeps us further away from experiencing God's love. But God's kingdom is not a kingdom that is based on do. God's kingdom is a kingdom that is based on done, the work that God has done through Jesus Christ on the cross and rising to life again. That is the foundation for everything we have and everything we know. I want to share one last thing with you, a quote that I saved on my phone because that's how we do things these days. This is from an author, speaker, who actually just passed away recently. Her name is Rachel Held Evans. She really uh, pushed the church in these last years to really think differently about what the church is supposed to be doing. And this is what she said in her book called Searching for Sunday. After she went through her own time of doubt and wanting to walk away from God and the church and feeling like the church was becoming more about shutting people out and figuring out who's in and who's out and who fits in and who doesn't. And she said, you know what? The gospel doesn't need a coalition of people devoted to keeping the wrong people out. It needs a family of sinners saved by grace, committed to tearing down the walls, throwing open the doors, and shouting, welcome. There's bread and there's wine. Come eat with us and talk. This isn't a kingdom for the worthy. It's a kingdom for the hungry. This is not a kingdom for the worthy. This is a kingdom for the hungry. There's something that God has put in us, a hunger for something more, something that lasts, something that is eternal. Maybe you don't know quite what that is yet. Maybe you don't know how to put your finger on it. Maybe you don't know. Maybe you're thinking, no, it's not God. There's something more than that because your image of God is just, well, just sitting here and listening to me talking. We all know this. You could be doing better things with your time. But what God has to say to you, and if he can say something through me, then that's something good. And what God wants to say through me to you today is that he is inviting you into a kingdom that is not a kingdom for the worthy, not a kingdom for people who have tried really hard to make themselves look like some kind of, I don't know, whatever your image is that you think what a Christian is supposed to look like. This is a kingdom for the hungry. Are you hungry today for something more? God is looking to satisfy your hunger. But here's where the faith part comes in, right? Because God can set out the most beautiful table with all the most lavish gifts and foods that God has to offer. But if I don't actually come to that table and say, God, I believe that you're able to meet my need with what you are offering me, then I won't experience it. It's not that God is withholding anything from us. God is not withholding anything from us. We withhold ourselves from God because we think it's a kingdom that's for the worthy and we don't realize that it's a kingdom for the hungry and so we don't come with our deepest hungers allowing God to meet those. Church, as you learn this for yourself, as you accept it, as you walk in it, as you practice this truth, and I'm going to call the worship team to come on up now as we close. As you learn this truth for yourself, then you will have a gospel, a good news to share with other people. So many times as Christians, we get this, oh, I gotta, I, I'm not being a good Christian because I'm not out there, you know, preaching on the street or whatever to people. How about church? We learn this for ourselves so that we have deep within us a good news that's worth sharing, that's worth living out. That when people look at us, they don't see somebody that's trying really hard to be a good Christian. But we see someone who's hungry for God, who knows that they are loved, who knows that they have been made new and that they've been adopted, welcomed into the family of God. I don't need anybody to tell me anything about, my, about myself. I know everything I need to know about my identity from my Heavenly Father from the one who has fathered me and the one who has mothered me in a way that I could never do for myself. The one who calls me his own. And I didn't have to work for it. Jesus did that. My work is to be hungry, stay hungry, and to believe. To believe that he is able to meet my needs. Let's pray, church.
God, I pray for every person this day who is living in that, that, <clears throat> that endless struggle. That endless struggle of, of feeling like we're never good enough, like we don't measure up, uh, like we're, we're, we're not um, enough. I pray that you would help us to just settle into that fact. We are not. in ourselves. Because our lives have been ravaged by sin and, and, and lies that we tell ourselves, that we believe things about ourselves that are not true. But God, when we look to you and when we allow you to give us our identity, when we allow you to say, this is who you are, my child, you no longer need live as a slave to fear and shame. But you are mine. When you share with us your holiness and your glory, that's enough. That's what we need to know. So Lord, help us to lift our heads, help us to see you giving us all of the love that you are fathering and mothering us today, that you know our every need today. Thank you, God. Would you stand and sing in closing today?